opened up a very nice uh, set to the last lunch. It's a full safety event, more food. Yeah. Uh, the next session is going to be presented by my colleague, Dr. Wang Kepay, and the topic will be multi-residue multi pesticide methodology.
monitor. So these are, from the analytical chemistry point of view, these are sample regions. So this 319 multiplied by this 500 or so, they are going to give you about 145,000 of those MRLs. For those of the substances or drugs that has no established MRL yet, they will generate to assign a 10 PPD uh, MRL limit to these compounds. So this is consistent uh, with the previously, we all know that Japanese positive list, right? Japanese positive list has about approximately 800 uh, compounds, and then many of them they assign a 10 PPD because they don't have the established MRL limit. Now you can see here, the pesticide analysis is a very uh, complicated Okay, because we have a variety of crops, 320, so we have a different matrix, and also we have to monitor about 500 PESA analysis. So obviously, sampling and sample preparation, particularly the sample preparation, is the one of the bottom okay. Also, when you even if you have the best bet, the most advanced the best bet, you can run that very sensitively, and but you have to process the data and then to uh, kind of identify what are the pesticides over there and also quality. So the data processing, uh, here we call it reporting, is also one of the bottlenecks. Now, the challenges in the pesticide analysis, uh, as mentioned already, uh, first is the sample variety, okay, because we have 300, uh, 300, about 300 different crops, we have a 500 different pesticides, and we have a different characteristics and the number of samples, we have to monitor a lot of samples and also require to have the low level uh, detection and the fast response is always required. Now, for pesticide analysis, it's not like those veterinary drug analysis, for example, if we, you have one chlorophyllical, people ask you to model chlorophyllical, you only have one compound and perhaps one uh, internal but here, the pesticide analysis, we generally prefer to use the screening method. We would like to run to detect as many as possible of the pesticide in one particular sample matrix. And then if we find some of the pesticide positive or suspiciously positive, and then we can do the confirmative analysis. These are more specific methods uh, for specific kind of pesticide. To confirm this. Now, the sample preparation to for this 500 pesticide can also be challenging because we have some pesticide uh, just not recovering very well. Though these are the pesticide assay are more volatile. So when you prepare the sample, you do the extraction at the room temperature, and you're going to have a very low recovery. For example, these are the uh, few pesticides here. And then to overcome this problem, we can have a very simple solution. We can add the dry ice, okay? So these are the uh, solid uh, carbon dioxide to the container of the sample, and then you homogenize of the frozen sample. So basically, uh, you have the advantage to keep it very cool to have the pesticide remain in your sample matrix, and also when you're frozen, you just kind of like homogenize it, but only you have a better homogenization because you could break all into very, very fine uh, species. Now, here let's look at the cryogenic effect on this pesticide level analysis. Without adding the uh, dry ice, these pesticides all have the recovery of 50% but with the dry ice added to it, you can see here the recovery are all from 75% to 100%. So the pesticide, these volatile pesticides uh, recover well uh, when you use the dry ice. Now, for most of the pesticide analysis, we have uh, various kind of extraction, solvent extraction techniques. Okay? Uh, I think just five years ago, I visited different Asian countries, 
uh, work in the laboratory with them. Uh, we found that some people using taxing, some people use the ethylacetate, and some people just use the protozoal. So, and also the cleanup can, can be also very different depending on your matrix. We have GPC, solid phase extraction, and temperature extraction, also the flash columns. Basically, it's a special, small, healthy column. You let it pass through to clean up. Nowadays, they all are replaced, uh, more and more uh, replaced by the so-called attachment method. Okay, before you can feed to the GCMS and LCMS. Now, the attachment method in the body, we already mentioned that. Okay, they use the acetonitrile to do the uh, extraction. Uh, I think the, one of the most important uh, advantages of the catch method is easy to use and also it covers a broad range of elements from the less powder basically to uh, from, actually from the mid polar to the high polar. They are suitable for the moisture samples, uh, mostly vegetables and if all those leaves contain moisture uh, it will be good for them. A low cost press response uh, is compatible with both LC, MS and GCMS. Uh, but there are also some limitations of the sketcher. For those of you who already tried this one, you all know that uh, they have the limited cleanup uh, capability because they are using the dispersed solid phase extraction. So it's not a completely uh, uh, kind of separation of the matrix. And they're not suitable for the fatty. We're going to have a uh, data amount to talk about the fatty. Uh, the single neutron can cause some problems in the GC uh, analysis because uh, GC, uh, the single neutron is not a very good solvent for GC in general. Now, all these uh, kind of challenges, high matrix content, number of interference, and need for the more selective. So we're, we're going to ask for the more selective determination. Okay. Here we are going to talk about two kinds of techniques for uh, developing thermal. One is the, the unique PLC MS uh, technique, and the other is the, the high resolution uh, MS. Now, here is the UH PLC MS inside analysis. Nowadays, they are, uh, the, the LC MS, the tender MS, is very good due to its selectivity and the low detection limits, speed and robustness. But they are only for the target quantum. Okay? There are only limited transitions for 200 to 300 quantum per round. And, and, and the transitions set up are sometimes different. So basically you need to know what you want to look before you can detect. Okay? You need to set up the particular uh, SI transitions for one particular compound. Now here is the uh, generally set up uh, out, outcome for the SI uh, optimization. Basically, you wrap in the collision energy and then you monitor the product lines to see where it's coming out of the message. And this is your collision energy. And then you can put the collision energy along with the parent and the product lines into your method heading. Okay. To do this, you need to have a standard. Okay. And then it will be very difficult right now. I'm not sure if you, uh, uh, you, are, you, you can succeed or not to, to obtain all the SI standards. Okay. To tune every one of them in order to set up this method. Okay. Uh, but unfortunately, in thermal, uh, we have so many uh, instruments around the world and uh, we work with them to collect all the SI transitions uh, from our customers as well as from of our application laboratories. And then we put it into a database incorporated into our newly released software called TraceFinder. So in the TraceFinder, we have a SIM database so we are not called a library because library is a different thing. So this is the only the database. The database is have the compound name. I think that if there's a, a the test number, we, we also have the test number for you to search and to compare because the compound can call different names. And then we have the parent eye, the product eye, 
and also the, the traditions. What we don't have is that we don't have the, the, the retention time because we realize that people using different colors, even the same color, we use a different gradient, they can come at a different time. So, but this will already be very uh, easy for you because if you have our triple four system, you can go in there to click, to search for the target compound and then to put it into them. Uh, currently, we have 1,500 of SRM traditions uh, corresponding to about nearly 1,000 of this uh, different kind of uh, compound, including uh, 300 to 400 pesticides. Okay? And this database is expanding. If you have our thermal software system, we, you can log on to our thermal supporting, please find the supporting website to download the latest um, the database, because the database is expanding. We are going to add more SRM building to the database, and you can just easily download and then put it into your software. Now, there is another an intelligent feature in our thermal uh, triple board system, it's called so-called the time SRM. We all know that when we do the GCMS or all LCMS, we need to have set a dwell time, okay? This dwell time, we generally, we don't want to get it too short. If you only set about a few milliseconds or so, and then your signal will not be very good, okay? It will be generally required to set about at least about 20 or 30 milliseconds or so. The longer is better, up to about maybe 100 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds, in order to have a, a much better signal. But we are going to monitoring about 500 PSI. If we all set together, that's just not enough dwell time allocated to each SRM traditions. And then we all know that in the LCM, LCMS analysis, there are just compound come from a different time. So there's a new point for us to monitoring the compound, let's say coming out at about six minutes, seven, seven minutes. There's no point from zero to six minutes we monitor this transition, okay? So we can let it start to monitor this transition before it's, right before it's just coming up, okay? So we have this so-called time SRM. Basically, we type in the transition, uh, come out the retention time for these transitions, the window, okay? If your compound are not very, very uh, retention time and stable, you can, uh, particularly for those compounds eluded at the beginning, you can give a wider window. But it doesn't matter here. The software will be determine at each time point which transition to water. You can, you can see here, here we probably have about 30 to 40 or so, the different compounds. At this particular one minute, we only monitor a few, about six or seven of them. Because other compounds will be eluded later, we do not have to monitor. So in this way, we maximize the dwell time for each SRM transition. And as mentioned before, the capture, the capture method used the acetonaltron. But once we got an acetonaltron extract, it will be very uh, difficult for us to inject directly because we have the acetonaltron is a very strong mobile based organic solvent as has a mobile base. And then if we shoot the uh, well, 100% acetonaltron, our peak, a lot of peak diluted at the beginning of the chromatogram will be a kind of broader. And in this way, uh, will be have a lower detection limits and then it's hard to integrate. And here, we need to add the water to dilute it so we can get a sharper peak for better communication. Now, one of the disadvantages of the capture method when I said that when we discuss the advantages is that it's not very good for the fat users. Here are some of the data showing that. Okay, here you see when we don't have any fat, this recovery is about 100% of it. But as the fat content increases, okay, and the, the recovery is becoming lower and lower, and some of them getting down to below 30% also. So this will going to ask for a different kind of uh, extraction method. So, what are the substances nature has the value? 
because it's just meat, right? So we have some legitimate meat and also some of the nuts have a lot of oil in it. Now, for these compounds, or those kind of a pesticide dissolved in this oil uh, fatty uh, matrix, uh, we still need to use a, a cyclohexane and isoacetate to do the extraction. Here is the general uh, procedure here. And after the extraction, we use the GPC cleanup. And then after cleaning up, we can feed to either GCMS or the LCMSMS for analysis. Now, why use the GCMS for pesticide analysis? Um, uh, this is simply because a lot of the compound does not amenable for the LC separations. So the GCMS offer a uh, very good separation. Okay. Uh, GCMS has the higher separation capacity generally than the LCMS. So it is very common, even without the GCMS, in the maybe 10 or 20 years ago, for GC or GCMS to analyze several hundred compounds in one block. We only recently uh, we starting to uh, explore uh, to use the LCMS to analyze several hundred of compounds. So these are the advantages of the GC and the GCMS. And with GC, previously, the traditional GC, we have the different kind of detectors. As mentioned early in the morning, that these detectors are not very specific. The specific detector is the GCMS. The GCMS is almost uh, exclusively uh, right now used for the test site analysis. They are easy to use, and then the spectra, they have the library, the EI library is very uniform across the different GCMS vendors, so it's easy for them to search the library, use the NIST or Wiley library to match, and then to identify the compound. But also, the GCMS still lack the sensitivity in many cases, and not enough conformation data point in typical matrix. Because when we do a conformative analysis, we mentioned that in the morning, the European Council 2002657 uh, required to have a four identification point. Four identification point means if you are running the single core GCMS SIM, you need to set up four SIMs. There are just not, uh, there are many compounds that just don't have uh, four spectral line with a good intensity. They maybe have one or two or three, but it will be very difficult to find every compound to have a false spectral lines to do such analysis. So here are some of the additional problems with the GCMS when we uh, incorporate it with the pressure method. Because the sensitivity, when we do the pressure method, we do not do very much of the concentration. It's, it's basically one to one, right? The, you start with a 10 gram of the sample matrix, you end up with a 10 mil of your uh, extracting, extracting acetonaltra. So it's uh, approximately one to one. So the sensitivity is, you still require to have good sensitivity in order to detect the low level of pesticide. And, the, and as mentioned, the final extract is in acetonaltra. Uh, acetonaltra is a very uh, good solvent, maybe for the LC, MS, but it is not a very good solvent for GCMS due to the, the expansion coefficient. <laughs> Uh, their behavior in the uh, in the GC England. So with that, you still have to go through the solvent exchange and the repeated injections of large volume extract in order to get the sensitive detection on a single core GCMS. Now, at Thermo, in 2007, we uh, introduced the, uh, the the triple core GCMS. This is as of right now, it's become a workhorse in pesticide analysis. So it has the benefit of a triple core MSMS. So we have the selectivity, and then the selectivity results in the low detection limit, the sensitivity. And also the speed of analysis, we can run up to 1,500 okay, the at, uh, compound in one single run. Okay. Uh, so that means that we can do 3,000 SRMs in one single run. So if your each compound uh, want to have two SRMs, uh, you can get to 1,500 in one single run. 
Now, because of the selectivity, we have the matrix elimination capabilities, and it's very robust, and can look at some of the additional uh, benefit as a result of this workflow. Less sample cleanup and a fast response and a lower cost, because you do not have to do those additional sample prep to eliminate your dirty matrix. And actually, uh, I think the, 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 the Korea company, Dongsu, who actually is the first, uh, uh, I, I think they got the, our world first triple core a GC ship. Okay, so because they basically came to the ASMS and they looked at the system and then they, they immediately purchased one on our world flow. Uh, the number one system ship in the world is to a Korean company, Dongsu. Now, here, we can have a comparison just to see how the single call uh, SIM mode uh, with the SRM mode. Now this is in the SIM. You can see here, uh, you have a very good identification of the peak here. This is in the SIM, you only have one data point. But you can see you still have noise here. If your GC has some problems, people can challenge you. Hey, why why this peak not that peak? Okay. So this, you can see the noise level is still there. This is uh, about E8 or something, the noise is about 40%. Okay? But with the, the SRM mode in your triple core GC system, you can see here this is the first transition, very clean, no noise. Actually, if you want to calculate the signal to noise ratio, this one may go to infinity because it's just simply no noise. And this is the second transition here. So with two SRM transitions, we can easily uh, satisfy the European Union's regulation required to have a four uh, IP point because each will be going to have two, uh, each SRM will count as two IP points. Here is another example with the TSQ quantum uh, XLS, our triple four GC. This is a one microliter injection of the pressure uh, extract directly. You can see here, this is a for the captain. This is the first uh, SRM, this is the second SRM. The first SRM normally is the intense ones. This is the more stronger ones for the quantitation. The second ones is for the confirmation here. You can see this can have a very good ratio measurements as well. Here are more examples here. This is in the symbol. You can see here, you see the peak, but have a very high uh, bedrock, the baseline. But in the SRM mode, the background is much lower. Your signal is much better. So you can do the quantitation and the identification uh, with confidence. Now, with this capture method, with just a one microliter of split injection on our quantum GC system, for, all, for those we have mentioned that uh, have some trouble to come up, they all have a very good recovery when we do this uh, spike experiment at 10 PDB and 50 PDB. The, these are all within 10% uh, also of the 100 and the CV is about 10 or less, 10% or less. Now, we have further uh, kind of a, a tools to improve the robustness of your quantum GC analysis. We have an inlet back flushing system. So we all know that the, 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 the I think that the, the, the contamination when you shoot the, uh, the samples uh, with a high contaminant, uh, high matrix effect, and also your color bleeding can, uh, can affect your mass detector sensitivity. Basically, this is going to contaminate your eye source. With the back flushing, you can just easily uh, use the, the carrier gas to black to back flushing your inlet while on your sample is doing analysis. So that will block all the color bleeding materials uh, enter your mass detector, uh, enter your ion source to contaminate the ion source. So this is going to increase the robustness of your method. So in this way, you can inject the whole sequence uh, without much of the loss of the sensitivity due to the contamination of the ion source. Now, um, I just finished with the GCMS example. 
but in general use method in screening analysis, we, it can fall into two categories. One is called target screening, as we mentioned. We know what we want to see. Okay? There's also a category called non-target screening, is that we don't know what we want to see. We just want to see what's in there. Okay? Maybe there's something, maybe nothing. Okay? So we have an excellent tool. Uh, the method is executive. We mentioned uh, a couple of times already. These are unique tools in the pesticide analysis because it offers a high resolution separation of the matrix from the animal. And also they have an excellent mass accuracy. So whenever you identify something, you can search the online database. It, I think the database is free. You can search the online database to get the list of the potential uh, contaminant. So with, because of, of we have a very good accurate mass results, you can from an accurate mass result to determine your elemental composition. Um, this is also the unique PLC compatible and uh, this is no compound specific setup, easy to use because this is for a full scale experiment. You do not have to set up each SRM. Okay, you, this is a full scale, you just define the best range and the resolution and then just press the button to go. Now, there are three uh, general strategies uh, for this unknown screen. First, you do the sample extraction, and then you use the UH PLC separation with exactly. For quantitation, we have the traditional our operating system uh, called the Excalibur, and also the LC Quant for quantitative analysis. For target screening, you have the so called Toxic ID. Toxic ID actually is a very small software, only a few hundred K uh, software, and it uses an Excel as a database. Basically, you can type all your compound with the best into the Excel, and then uh, this software is going to search the raw data against this list in the tox in this Excel. So whenever you find something, it will show, and then you can plot it. Now, if you are completely unknown, you want to compare what's the normal sample of your above normal sample. We can use the so-called C. So it's a label-free uh, differentiation software, basically align all the chromatograms of the two sets of the sample, okay, let's say A and B, and you know they are different, but then you don't know what they are different on the LCMS. You run both, sometimes visually you cannot see the difference, but this software will first do the alignment, and then it will do the frame, and then try to identify, to compare the spectra of each frame to give you what's different, what's the same. Now, here I show you the example about the, how the resolution can affect your determination. Um, this is the one of the test side for the, for the, uh, uh, Imaza at 225 nanogram per gram. It's a 25 ppb in the feet. So here is not the concentration. Okay, here is the best window. Okay, this is a 100 ppm best window. You can see here, this at 10,000 resolution, uh, at 100,000 resolution, these will be the same, almost the same for the 100 ppm best window. But the 100 ppm mass window is not accurate. There's a lot of compounds, maybe several hundred of compounds can have a similar mass okay, falling into the window. At 50 ppm, you can see here, so they have a lot of other things has already been eliminated. You, you, you only see this compound here. But at 10 ppm, at this 2 ppm mass window, the our executive, we can still hold at 100 ppm, uh, at 100,000 resolution, this will not be changed. But with the 10,000 10, resolution, they're going to change. You can see here that we're not going to see any peak at 2 ppm into it. Because these uh, peaks may overlap with other interference peaks and then cause the shift of the mass. Now, here is another example of how the high resolution can benefit for your detection. At uh, 10,000, these peaks are very noisy. At 100,000, these peaks are much better. And then for this particular pesticide in the spinach, 
at 10,000, you cannot even detect it. Because the resolution is very low, your peak is overlapped with other peaks, such as in the top experiment, it can only run up to 30,000. And then you still have substantial overlap with your matrix peak. So once you have peak overlap, when you average, this could the peak will could be branched into other peaks. So you are not going to detect your target count. But with 100,000 resolution, you can unambiguously identify this compound. Now, it's, the executive is also a very good quantitation tool. Uh, this is from 0.1 ppb to 100 ppb. They all show a linear, a very good linearity. Uh, the executive also have a very high speed, up to 10 data points a second scan. Okay? So this will be, will be good for your UPLC operation too. Because if your UPLC has a peak width of five to six seconds, it can give you enough data point for peak detection and quantitation. The high resolution aspect of data from our executive uh, exceed the requirement of the European Union's current regulation. The European Union's current regulation is defined probably in 94, 1994 or so. Uh, at that time, they asked for two eyes and have a 5 ppm mass accuracy. They defined the high resolution as 10,000, okay? But we all know that uh, there's a lot of examples to show that we need to at least 50,000 in order to uh, eliminate the matrix in interference to get a confidence results. Now here is the summary. The multi-residue method right now, screening method, is the preferred method to run and then followed by the transformative analysis. The test side properties and the different matrix which will require us to perform a different sample uh, extraction and the cleanup. Here we introduce a different technologies with some of the tricks, I think you add the dry ice. And uh, the test side type dictates whether GC or LC MS can be used. A lot of test sites are not finalized very well in LC, such as the organochlorine. I think the GC MS is still the preferred uh, method. The tender mass uh, with the SRM technology and then the higher resolution accurate mass increase the multi residue method success. So this is going to be the trend of the future uh, for pesticide analysis. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Wong, for the nice uh, presentation on the pesticide. Um, now I think uh, we go for a short coffee break if it's not too much you. We did this coffee break very quickly after lunch because we know that it's very tiring uh, after, after lunch. So uh, enjoy the coffee break and we will come back at uh, we'll come back at two o'clock. We will start again at two o'clock. So enjoy the coffee break, take a rest, stretch a little bit, and I'll see you again at two o'clock. Thank you for your concentration.